Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCagliano. Welcome to What the Ship. We're going to cover the top five stories in the maritime sector. And man, we've got five stories for you today. Once again, always worried that we're going to run out of material. There's not going to be five major stories to talk about. No, not a problem. Again, we hit them. And each of these are amazing, including from the first to the last. So let's go ahead and jump right in to story number one. All right, story number one builds on a story we talked about last week, and it's just one of those great maritime stories that just keeps giving. Uh, it's not well known, but in the maritime sector, you can arrest not just individuals, but ships. Yes, I mean, Ponch and John can pull up alongside of a ship and arrest it. And what that means is the ship will be held liable for bills and finances it owes. And that can be extracted directly from the vessel, either selling goods that are on the vessel, cargo, fittings, or the vessel itself. And we talked about this story last week, and it's still continuing, but getting even stranger. So this is a GCAPM story. Uh, this one's from Bloomberg. Billionaire crew CEO resigns after ordering ship to evade U.S. Marshals. Yes, there's a ship out there trying to evade U.S. Marshals as we speak. So the story, Jenning Hong Kong chairman and chief executive officer Lim Kok Fei resigned days after the company filed to wind up its business. And as U.S. Marshals worked to arrest one of the ships whose, which diverted its final voyage to end in the Bahamas instead of landing on Saturday in Miami as planned. This is the maritime executive story here that has the Crystal Symphony diverted to the Bahamas to avoid arrest warrants. Lim, who owned 76% of Jenning Hong Kong, stepped down with effect from January 21st, the company said in a stock exchange filing. Also resigned as a deputy CEO and president, neither man had any disagreement with the board, the company said. Well, again, what we're seeing right now is these two companies, Jenning Hong Kong and Crystal Cruises, which have been married together now, filing bankruptcy. And again, these cru th this cruise line does not have the depth that the bigger cruise lines, the Royal Caribbean, the Norwegian, and Carnival have. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. We knew it was only a matter of time until some of these come up. Uh, story here from a few days ago on G-Captain kind of files on this, how a billionaire's global cruise empire imploded in Hong Kong. Again, this is also from Bloomberg. Uh, this, you know, again, all has to do with COVID and the fact that cruise lines weren't making money. Cruise lines had prophesized that profits will only go up and therefore invested in massive overbuilding. And when all of a sudden the cruise industry stopped sailing, now the cruise industry was kind of like playing musical chairs and there's no chairs to sit on. We're stuck with all these assets. They have financed and leveraged them to the nth degree. And now what we see is the smaller of these cruise lines are going to start losing business. And we're seeing that play out right here with Genting Hong Kong. Uh, you also see it here with this story also levied U.S. Marshals ready to arrest the luxury cruise liner for unpaid fuel bill. This happens. Ships will divert out when Hanjin cruise line, a uh, Hanjin container line back in 2016 went bankrupt. They ordered their vessels to stay at sea. Don't come into ports for fear that the ships would be arrested. What's interesting here is how this is a in impacting some cruise lines, but not all. This story was in GCAP a few days ago. Mike Schuller wrote this one, American cruise lines building 12 new coastal cruise ships for the U.S. market. So U.S. Uh, American cruise lines, who I should mention I have worked for in the past. I haven't sailed with them for a couple of years now. I did a guest lecture on board. I sailed on board and gave talks on maritime sector stuff, kind of what you're getting here for free people on the cruise line got, but uh, they're building 12 new vessels. And that's an indication that the domestic and smaller cruise market is much better off than the larger international one. Uh, it's interesting to know American Cruise Lines build all their vessels in the United States. They're Jones Act compliant. They are built in Salisbury, Maryland. They're building to these new designs too. this catamaran hull. They had an issue 
with some of their coastal vessels, there was a very uh, uh, visible issue with one, one of their ships ran aground in, off Kentucky in the Ohio River. These catamarans are much shallower draft, much more stable too. And so I think you see this happening with American Cruise Lines going for this new design vessel. But again, very interesting where you're seeing a smaller cruise line genting right now, going out of business, ships evading, whereas American Cruise Line is building and trying to get more vessels into the domestic market. So that's story number one. So story number two deals with obviously the issue facing the supply chain right now. And we're seeing multiple stories come out with this across the board. I want to give you just a, a little bit of a swath of stories here that kind of discuss this. And because I, I got to tell you, if you read some, especially in the mainstream media, they're talking about the fact that, listen, the supply chain issue is over. Things are returning back to normal. But if you get into the weeds here and you read stories from people in the shipping industry and carriers, I got to be careful with that because there's a lot of issues at play here. So this story, a Bloomberg story, new ship and supply trackers flash caution amid Omicron worries. Again, there's a Bloomberg story. Global supply chains are nearing a turning point that's set to help determine whether logistic headwinds abate soon or keep restraining the global economy and prop up inflation well into 2022, according to several new barometers of the strange. Just a week before the start of Lunar New Year. Now, Lunar New Year is February 1st this year. Lunar New Year is a historic period in ocean shipping. China and East Asia shuts down for a week. So basically everything stops moving out of Asia. The factory shut down, the port shut, everything shuts down. And usually that's a post Christmas end of the year holiday in the West, in Europe and the United States and North America for everybody to catch their breath, to finish offloading everything. We go into March with a big dip down and then we reset and restart. The problem right now is the question whether or not that reset even happens in Asia because of shutdowns due to Omicron and everything else. There's a big question whether or not things shut down in China and East Asia at all, because they're already at a slow level. And because to catch up, they may not do this. So from Europe to the U.S. and China, production and transportation have stayed bogged down in the early days of 2022 by labor and part shortages, in part because of the fast spreading Omicron variant. The big Unknowns, whether solid demand from consumers and businesses will start to loosen up, allowing economies to finally see some easing in supply bottlenecks. For example, if inflation is too much, people stop lowering what they're ordering, then that will ease up. I think, however, there's other issues at play here. The supply chain is changing. They don't know yet what people want to order and not to order. Half the people are back at work, half aren't. This is causing flux in, in the supply chain. And a lot of companies are ordering hedging their bet in ordering for both contingencies. What if people go back to work? What if they don't go to back to work? We better have stock and inventory in case that happens. Fresh indicators from the private and official sectors are in high demand because there's still much uncertainty in industries overlooked by mainstream economics before the pandemics. So this story looks at everything from the Bloomberg Economics Index to the Kuhn and Nagel's disruption in indicators, flexport gauges, Federal Reserve stress monitor, which I I don't buy what the Federal Reserve stress monitor is doing right now. They basically are arguing it's at the highest it's ever been. Therefore, it's got to fall. I, I don't think that's a good measure. Morgan Stanley's index, Citigroup's in it. They're looking at all these indexes in here. They're looking at everything. And you add these stories to this. So this is another story in GCAP. And this one's from Lodestar. Asia, U.S. West Coast spot rates spike ahead of Chinese New Year. So there are two rates that you move containers by. Long-term rates, these are the rates that you book long in advance, and they tend to be low because you're booking way out in advance. Spot rates is what you get last minute. So you know, if you want to book a flight, you tend to book a flight several weeks, months in advance, and you get the lower flight. If you get a book the next day, it's going to be more expensive. That's what we're talking about here. But what we're seeing is these rates are spiking again, meaning that people are rushing to get goods booked. You have a couple of issues here, not just Chinese New Year. You have the ongoing labor negotiations with the ILWU, the Inter International Longshoremen Workers Union on the West Coast, which expires on June 30th. People are front-loading their cargo, and you have disruptions across ports in Asia and the United States. So all of that is seeing this. You see right here the spot rates 
Drury's uh, West Coast component put on 5% to $11,197 per 40 foot. Well, the Fredo's Baltic index, not the dry index, this is their container index. This was a confusion in a story I read this weekend, which includes an element of premium fees gained 3.5% to 15,139, whereas the East Coast is sitting at 13,987 and 17,023. Add to that story again, more of this. This is from uh, Barry Parker, set stage for 2022, Wall Street shipping analysis, very bullish on the box market. And that is true. The, the stock market is looking at the, the container industry as having a, another significant year for 2022. This links over to a, a, a analyst roundtable on YouTube. Really good. Really recommend you watch it. Just, just really interesting perspectives. This also is backed up by Greg Miller over on Freight Waves who had two stories out on this, and I'll pull both of them up here for you. This first one, or this is actually the second one of the two, tricky time for shipping stocks, course corrections ahead. So Greg, uh, who loves to talk about this, he absolutely adores this stuff. And I, it's one of the reasons I love following Greg. What's priced into the container stocks? Can container liners show discipline? That's the big question I have. If you catch the interview I did with Jay Mintzmeyer, we talked about this. The container liners are flush with cash, what are they going to do to spend it? Are they going to be a drunken sailor on shore leave or are they going to be smart? That's a big question that we see coming forward. Uncertainty over the tanker recovery sector. That's true. Tankers are down in the dumps right now. Shipping investors base, who's investing in this? And then he had an earlier story and this, I found this story really interesting, kind of builds on that one right here, where tanker, bulker, LNG rates drop while container rates hold near the top. Overall, this means that there's a lot at play in shipping sector right now in terms of what's going forward. Right now, the rates are high. Everybody keeps saying they're dropping. They're coming down from where they were at historic highs, but they are still ridiculously high. So you got to be very careful of, of what's going forward here. Until Chinese New Year, after February, and unless the ILWU gets a contract renegotiation in place, by March or April, it's going to be crazy for 2022, particularly for containers. All right, let's go over to story number three. Story number three deals with ship technology. And technology, and in particular, the propulsion of vessels is the big unknown looming over the shipping sector. I will be talking about this time and time and time again. On January 1st, 2020, the International Maritime Organization mandated a change in fuel for vessels. They went to what's called very low sulfur fuel. And the plans are to cut carbon, uh, decarbonize the world's ocean fleet by 50% by 2050. However, that is being pushed forward. And whether or not that gets enacted is a whole different issue. But there are big impetuses right now to enact changes in propulsion and fuel methods. And three stories right now deal with that, all coming out at the same time, all have implications on that. So this first one on GCAPM is a Reuters story, world's first hydrogen tanker to ship major um, uh, maiden cargo from Australia to Japan. A Japanese-Australian venture producing hydrogen from brown coal is set to ship its maiden cargo on the world's first liquid hydrogen carrier from near Melbourne to Kobe on Friday in a test delayed by nearly a year because of COVID-19 pandemics. The Suiso frontier built by Japan's Kawasaki Heavy Industries arrived on Friday in Kobe in Southern Japan following a longer trip than expected 16 days as the owners sought to avoid rough weather and rough seas uh, for the venture, uh, hydrogen energy supply chain. Uh, this is a 500 million Australian million, about $360 million project backed by the Japanese and Australian governments in a way to switch to cleaner energy and cut carbon emissions. This is the transportation of hydrogen. Hydrogen burns perfectly clean. The only byproduct you get from hydrogen is water. That's it. It is, it is the cleanest burning entity out there. And it's a renewable. It's not like it, it is a renewable. And what we're seeing here is a hydrogen tanker hauling fuel. Now you're sitting there going, well, hydrogen, that's really expensive, really explosive, Sal. It's, you know, I've got images of Hindenburg in my head here. Yeah, but so is gasoline. 
let me be clear, grain is highly explosive when you're loading it. There's always dangers of, of cargo. Let's be clear, LNG, liquefied natural gas is extremely dangerous. But this is a really interesting implementation because if you can get hydrogen fuel cells working, then you're seeing a change in propulsion. And this shipment is the first of its kind. Go over here, same type of story. This is also a GCAP story. Japan tests autonomous navigation using large ferry. Japan shipbuilder Mitsubishi Heavy Industries announced its completion of what it claims is the world's first full autonomous navigation demonstration involving, <coughs> excuse me, a large car ferry. Test took place this week and it promotes the development of fully autonomous. According to MHI, the test demonstrated the world's first fully autonomous navigation system on board a 222 meter ferry with autonomous berth, uh, port berthing and unberthing. It included turning and reversing movements and high-speed navigation up to 26 knots. Other new te technologies in the fully autonomous operation include sensors to detect other ships using infrared cameras, a remote engine monitoring system, and a sophisticated cyber security system. Uh, the company said the advances in full autonomous ship navigation intended to address issues such as crew shortages and accident prevention as seen as significant steps towards safer and more efficient coastal shipping. Now, let's be clear. We saw this test recently in Norway that was fully autonomous, nobody on board, but that was 12 miles. Uh, and there was no danger of car, uh, there was a limited cargo on board. This is a ferry, which is really interesting. Now understand what autonomous means doesn't mean unmanned. It doesn't mean no crew. It means automating more of the vessel. And what that means is, as they said right there, less crew, you're still going to have crew on board. Let me be clear. All you need is one hose line to pop a leak and you sink this vessel. And if there's nobody on board to fix it, you lost the vessel. Uh, you also will have a heck of a time getting insurance for this vessel if there's no crew on board. What Autonomous is looking to do is reduce the number of crew on board. But really one of the big things I think that we're going to see with Autonomy is uplink to shoreside stations to monitor these vessels, to prevent collisions, to prevent accidents where if somebody is monitoring vessel traffic, these could be prevented. Uh, this is going to become more and more a feature, particularly in coastwise. Uh, the issue you have here is cyber, let's be clear. The big ocean carriers are deathly concerned ever since Maris got hit by the Napietia virus in 2017 and nearly lost its entire network. Uh, you're very unlikely to see ships go completely autonomous for fear that they could be hacked and hijacked and shipped away and never seen again. Here on the coast wise, more autonomy is probably going to take place. And add to it this story, this is a maritime executive, China completes trial for largest electric river cruise ship, a ship entirely powered by batteries, powered by a 7,500 kilowatt marine power battery. Now, I should mention that this vessel has a range of 60 miles. So it is obviously not something we're gonna see replace ocean going vessels. You would have to power this, plug this vessel in. It's designed, again, river cruises. We've just seen Crowley introduce the first electric harbor tug come in. These are ideal for areas like this where they can get the power. Now, is this clean? Is it green? I, Depends where the power is coming from, I guess. If you're if you're plugging in your electric river ferry to a coal-fired plant, I don't know how green that is. We're seeing this happen. And this is the evolution we're seeing in navigation and technology. This is probably one of the most significant changes in marine technology since we transitioned from sail to steam. And uh, it's an interesting period to watch. That was story number three. Story number four are two stories out on G Captain, one for the Port of LA, one for the Port of Long Beach. We got the end of the year numbers from LA and Long Beach. LA hit 10.7 million TEUs. Long Beach hit 9.3 million TEUs, meaning the combined effort of LA and Long Beach hit 20 million containers in 2021. That is a record. Yeehaw. Celebrate, everybody. Cheers. I was a mariner. I was a sailor. And it's also 12 o'clock at noon here in North Carolina. And that was lemonade. So 
celebration, LA and Long Beach, going nuts. However, let's put this into some context right now. 20 million is an amazing feat. It it is an impressive feat, without a doubt. LA and Long Beach, hats off to stevedores, pilots, tugboat operators, drayage operators, everybody involved. This was magnificent. It was absolutely insane, incredible. But again, we got to be careful about how we look at numbers and how we judge numbers. A lot of the increase that we saw in LA and Long Beach were in early 2021, uh, LA in particularly. Long Beach saw the growth because of the development of the LBCT terminal that fully opened, fully automated, up and running. That's one of the key things there. And one of the things that's underlying this story is a couple of things. We're still seeing the backlog at LA and Long Beach. We have not cleared it. Again, it's it's Monday, so we're going to get an announcement from LA about their you know postponing the container uh, container dwell fee uh, uh, fine for the twelfth, thirteenth time. I lost track now. I got my uh, I got my my card stamped, so I'm, that's all I cared about. What is going to happen here? But one of the interesting stories was this one that came out by Lodestar. New York nudges biggest U.S. container port title as West Coast imports slacken. So this is John McCowan. If you don't follow John, you should. Everything going on here, along with providing raw data, which, again, I I can't say enough about it, is is really the the most important thing. Because if you don't have the raw data, there's no reason to look at this. And he's got charts and graphs and tables in here, and he's got all that kind of great stuff that you want in here. And again, I'll link this into the show notes. But what I want to show you is, is this right here. And, and this is a table he has. And this, this kind of shows you, this is import volumes. And what he has is here is the December numbers. And if you look at the December numbers, look at Los Angeles. Los Angeles imported 417,794 TEU. <clears throat> New York was only about 6,000 containers behind LA. And New York is up over its previous December number. It's up 15%. LA is down 9.3. If you look at the three month average, you know what have they done for the last three months? New York is up 4.2%. LA is down 10%. And if you look at the year, uh, the last 10 months, and you look, you look at that percentage change he has on here, then you start seeing this change really grow. New York is showing substantial growth, but look at other ports. Look at Savannah, look at Norfolk, look at Houston, look at Charleston, and then look at West Coast, Oakland, 5.8, Seattle, Tacoma, 15.5, Los Angeles, 14.9, and then Long Beach, 14.6. This graph right here by John shows the export volumes, the how many containers are being exported. Leading exporter is Long Beach, 113,687. And that's down 14% from last December. New York, 98,177. That's down 5.5%. Savannah, 99,977, down 5.5%. LA is in fourth, and it's down 22.9%. Over three months, LA is down 30.8 months over the last 12 months, <clears throat> down 21.3%. This is export volumes. And again, look at where those numbers are. And you're seeing LA being down. New York, on the other hand, last 12 months up 2.2%. It's one of the only places that and Charleston that's showing a uptick right now. And I just I circle back here to the beginning of John's report to hit his three major uh, points he makes. 1.2% inbound gain in December as East Coast volumes hit record. So the East Coast is booming. Outbound volume down 13.5% as exports extend underperformance. In other words, we're not shipping out enough. It's just not. The, the, the priority is on empty containers right now to get back to Asia to load. The, con- the economy between East West and inbound outbound widens more. We're seeing the East and Gulf Coast gaining. They're moving. And that's part of this shift that we're seeing. We're physically seeing the shift now of cargo to the east and west. And it has to do with delays in L.A. and Long Beach, congestion in L.A. and Long Beach, problems that they had in Oakland initially. And most importantly of all is shipping, (coughs) excuse me, shipping companies, those who are shipping the goods 
don't want to get caught on the West Coast should the West Coast ports close at the end of June because of the ILWU. Now, understand, it's not as simple. It is not as simple as just routing a ship. Hey, we're going to send our ship to Savannah instead of going to L.A. No, because those containers have to be received. They have to be unpacked, restuffed. You need distribution sites. You need warehouses. You need pop-up yards. But remember, Savannah is much more conducive to this because of the land available versus L.A. and Long Beach. And this is why I keep talking about the idea that we need to have an overarching plan for the allocation of that infrastructure money that is just being thrown out there right now without a lot of rhyme and reason. So this was story number four. Story number five is always the story that I find the most interesting and, and, and innovative out there. And one of the things I've been pushing for a lot is for more Americans to get involved in shipping. And one of the things I think we need to do is get Americans into the shipping industry. You know, the Elon Musks, the Jeff Bezos, get the billionaires, get the people out there involved in ocean shipping. I can't tell you how much I think we need to mainstream this. That's why when this story came across, this wasn't exactly who I had as the mastermind to restart American oceanic shipping. Yes, Pete Davidson and Colin Jost are entering the shipping industry. First time for What the Ship, we're going to the New York Post. Yes, the New York Post for shipping news. It seems as if Colin and Pete are delving into the shipping industry by buying a used, and I mean a used, Staten Island Ferry, the old John F. Kennedy that was up for auction. They have bought it. And just to prove this is not a joke, and I'm not just reading the New York Post, here is the G-Captain story written by Mike Schuller, who had the great, the great uh, headline, no joke, Saturday Night Live stars by decommissioned Staten Island Ferry. Yep, the John F. Kennedy has been bought by Colin Jost and Pete Davidson. Uh, they bought it for a reported $280,000. Now, that's a steal. Can I be clear? That's, that, that's amazing for a ship without an engine no engine this thing they're gonna have to tow this thing out of saint george ferry terminal i don't know where they're gonna go with it but they're gonna have to do something with it uh their plan is to turn it into a party boat of some kind uh really not new we've seen this happen before with vessels think queen mary out in long beach the qe2 out in dubai uh this has happened quite a bit it'll be interesting to see whether or not they're going to use it uh with power i mean are they going to sail it around new york harbor will it be a floating i mean we'll actually go out there and sail around uh it has a huge amount of space uh it's certified it's 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 licensed you can replace the engine i mean actually put it drop in a new diesel engine and 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 replace it it's going to be really interesting to see it uh it's going to take some money uh that's for sure and and you know as long as you know kim kardashian and 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 Scarlett Johansson are good with it. I guess these two are good with it. So we're going to see what happens with it. I just found this story to be extremely amusing for a variety of reasons that, that th these are the ones that, again, you know, these are the two that are going to be the face of, of American ship owning. And, you know, I go back to Mike Schuller's thing here. Enjoy ship owners, fellas. Just don't quit your day jobs. You're going to need the money is accurate because the old saying about a ship is very appropriate the happiest days in a ship owner's life is the day they buy it the day, the day they sell it and what is a ship but a hole in the water you throw money at so i hope you enjoyed today's episode of what the ship five top stories in the maritime sector uh, a lot going on out there, obviously, and my goal is to keep you abreast of it. If you enjoyed the episode, I can't see why you wouldn't enjoy this episode. It's a great episode. Uh, please subscribe, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they get out. Please share it across social media, retweet it, put it on Facebook, put it on Instagram, put it on Twitter, put it on whatever you use. Get it out there. Let's get it across. Getting ready to peak over 32,000 subscribers. Really want to get over that hump over to the next level and see the channel grow. If you can, please become a Patreon. Support me through Patreon, www.patreon.com slash W-G-O-W, what's going on with shipping, W-G-O-W shipping, uh, to become a Patreon member. And until our next episode, this is Sal, signing off. <laughs>